Hi everyone, my name is Rebecca Yank, and today I'm going to be walking you through the rules of annotation for annotating a phage genome. Later videos will walk you through these rules and the tools we use to observe and implement these rules in more detail, but today I'm just going to get you familiarized and introduced to um, the rules and their content. At any point in the video, you are free to pause and read through the official rules listed at the top of each slide, but for our purposes today, we're just going to be reading through the simplified rules so we can really get down to what's happening um, in each of them. So the first rule reads, the frame in which we read each specific gene matters. It's how we read the whole genome. Once the frame is predicted and identified, that's the frame for that whole gene. So the tool that you will be using in the future um, to help understand this rule a little bit better is called GeneMark S. And GeneMark S provides a graphical representation of all six of the frames um, that exist. There are three forward frames and three reverse frames. And so um, a frame is kind of like a lens that we read the codons, which are made up of amino acids, through. And so remember, as you're building your case for um, for this genome to help determine the functions of each of these genes, each of, each of those start with choosing a frame to read it through. Um, that's going to be one of the very first most important parts in your case for that particular gene. The second rule of annotation was already incredibly simple, so we just left it as is, and it reads, genes do not often overlap by more than a few base pairs, although up to about 30 base pairs is legitimate. So in a phage genome, space is incredibly limited. So some genes will overlap to save some space between each of them. So overlaps are expected and they're often not extreme, which is why only 30 base pairs is the maximum that you can generally allow for. The third rule really touches back onto the second one and it reads, there's not a lot of space because phage genomes are so small. So space, or real estate, is conserved by squishing everything together. And so, like in rule two, the real estate of the phage genome is pretty scarce, and so the genes are going to be squished together very tightly just to conserve as much space as possible. So like in rule two, you're going to have a little bit of overlap because of this rule that explains why. The fourth rule of annotation reads, GeneMark and Glimmer are computer programs that predict where genes are located and where they start based on coding potential. The starts called by these programs are important evidence for our annotations for our case building. So Glimmer and GeneMark are computer programs that have been trained to make predictions on where they think the starts of a gene are. Um, but ultimately, we are the decision makers, not the computers. Sometimes they'll disagree because of the way that they were programmed to look for these starts, um, but that is why we are coming in and we are annotating so that we can find these discrepancies between them and ultimately make the best judgment for where we think a start will be. We will look heavily to Gene Mark and Glimmer to help build our case um, because if they do agree, that's pretty good evidence that a start does begin at a particular base pair location. The fifth rule of annotation reads, just because a gene comes up as unknown function or doesn't have any similar genes in other phages does not mean we need to delete it. We simply don't know what it does. So following the rules of Synteny, um, sometimes we have to input a certain gene's function as MKF or no known function. And really it just means that. We know that it has a function, we just don't know what it means specifically. The sixth rule of annotation is definitely pretty long, so if you do need to pause and read the official rule, feel free to do so. But the simplified rule reads, if you find a gap that is more than 120 base pairs, we need to inspect it carefully to decide if there could be a gene there that the computer missed. We'll do this by comparing our phage to other phages and looking for a good BLAST or HHPred alignment. And so what this rule is kind of reminding us of is that the real estate of a phage genome is incredibly rare, and so we need to be using all of the space possible. And if we do find a really large gap, we need to be very careful to look and see, did the computer miss a prediction that really is a gene there? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at other genes that we know are similar to the gene that we're annotating and see, did they call um, a gene in that gap that we have? And if they did, we have a pretty good starting point to look at. 
if there's not a similar phage that we know to look at, we can also use GeneMark S um, to look at that graphical, graphical representation um, to look in that space. And we can also, um, if we find something you know, that might be a gene, we're not really sure, we're going to use the tools BLAST or HHPRED to see if that specific sequence in the gap actually does code for a gene with a function. The seventh rule reads, if you have a forward and reverse gene right next to each other, you'll need to have a 50 base pair gap between the genes. And so something about phage genomes is that if you have a switch between some forward reading genes and some reverse reading genes, you're going to have, need to have a 50 base pair space in between the two so that something called a promoter can do its job. And so you're going to need a 50 base pair gap in between the first forward and reverse genes, and then you're going to need a 50 base pair gap after the reverse genes and before the next forward genes. The eighth rule reads, genes are usually at least 120 base pairs long. If they're less than 200 base pairs, we need to pay extra attention to them and build a strong case for that gene. Essentially, this is saying if a gene is fewer than 200 base pairs long, but still more than 120 base pairs, it could still be a gene, but we need to be extra careful in making our educated decision and building our case for that particular gene. If it's less than 120, it isn't a legitimate gene. But if it's more than 200, you're probably good to go. The ninth rule reads, we don't often see frequent switches between forward and reverse genes. So remember back to rule three, where we learned that the space in a phage genome is incredibly conserved. And so um, we don't want to be wasting a whole lot of space. And seeing the switches between forward and reverse genes would actually be wasting a lot of space because we learned in rule seven that there have to be 50 base pair gaps between the forward and reverse genes on either side so that the promoters can do their job. And so the phage genome doesn't usually have a lot of switches between those forward and reverse genes. So we need to keep that in mind because if the computer does call a lot of switches, we can assume that those aren't correct just because we know these rules about phage genomes. The tenth rule of annotation is that all genes will end with one of the three stop codons, TAG, TGA, or TAA. And so something to remember about stop codons is that they only code for stops. And we'll learn why that is important in just a moment. Now the 11th rule of annotation reads, each gene starts with a start codon, ATG, GTG, or TTG. And TTG is used less often than the other two. So just like the stop codons had particular um, codons indicating that stop, the start codons also have particular codons indicating their starts. The interesting thing about the starts though is that they can also code for other amino acids that can be used even in the middle of certain genes. And so that is why we have to be very careful about selecting the correct start, because you could have any one of those ATG or GTG or TTGs, you know, in that beginning range of the gene. And so we need to make sure that we're choosing just the right one um, to select the proper start so we can continue reading the rest of the gene in the right order. Whereas when we get to a stop, we know that it's a stop and it's not going to code for anything differently like these starts can also do. So the 12th rule of annotation is multifaceted and in other words, it's very long. So we just decided to stick with the simplified version on this slide. And so I'm just going to go through and talk about those um, number points just as we go. I'm not going to read the whole thing and kind of jump back through. So it starts off reading. A big part of annotating is choosing where the start of the gene is. Here are the things we need to consider. Number one is that small gaps and overlaps between the previous gene are good, whereas large gaps and overlaps are not ideal, but they're also not impossible. So we know from the previous rules that choosing the start is incredibly important because it determines the frame um, that you're using for that gene, and um, we also know that it's going to be a little bit more difficult of a decision because those start codons do code for other amino acids to be used throughout the gene. And so when you're presented with all of this data, you're going to need to have some tools to select the proper start. And so something to keep in mind is when you have um, two sets of information and they both seem to kind of look the same, you can look to the gaps and overlaps um, to see, okay, all of the data looks kind of similar, but this one has a smaller gap. That's generally going to be the better selection to make 
versus the larger gap. That's not the only determining factor, but it is something that you can add into your toolbox in building a case for a particular gene's start. Part two of rule 12 reads, use starter aider to compare your phage to similar phages in the same cluster. If most of the similar phages call a certain start, there's a good chance that that's the start in your own phage as well. So starter aider is another great tool that you'll be using throughout the annotation process in helping select um, the starts for different genes. And so just like the rule says, it is used to compare your phage to other phages and the starts that they call for particular genes. And so you're able to go through and look at both a graphical representation and a text report to see where most of the phages in your cluster or family are calling the start at that particular gene. And so it's not uh, that they all call it at the very same location, they do vary, but you can generally look at the trends and see, oh, it makes sense that mine would follow the same trends as all of the others in some cases, but in other cases it may be that all of the phages choose different starts across the board, and so you may have to look other places for other pieces of evidence rather than just comparing to the trends that you see in your cluster. Part three of rule 12 reads, a high z-score of two or more and a final score closer to zero is favorable. So you may be asking, what's a z-score? What's a final score? And basically what those are in reference to is something called a ribosome binding site. And to make things as simple as possible, they, they use a lot of really cool math. It's um, a standard deviation and some other um, cool processes, but we're just gonna be looking at the, um, the scores that the computer programs give. And so the z-score, we're gonna be looking for the scores of roughly two or more. It can be in the neighborhood of a little bit less than two, a little bit more than two. And then the final score, if it's closer to zero, that's probably pretty good. It's usually a negative number. Uh, but those are going to be good pieces of evidence in our case for a particular start. And finally, part four of rule 12 says, we need to combine all of these pieces of evidence to decide where to call the start. And so basically it's just reminding us that it's not going to be any one of these particular um, parts of the rule in choosing our start, but rather we're gonna be looking at all of the evidence and seeing, okay, where is this evidence pointing us to? Um, and it's just, it's reminding us to be a good scientist and look at all of the evidence rather than just being narrow-minded and focusing in on one thing. We need to observe all of the options and all of the data. The 13th rule of annotation says that tRNA genes require special attention. And so this rule is just reminding us that um, in certain annotation and bioinformatic programs, so in the official rule it lists DNA master, they're not called this precisely. And so we need to be extra careful not to just trust exactly what the computer tells us. We need to observe all of the data, look at all of our options, and make the best, most educated decision that we possibly can in our annotation. The 14th rule of annotation just reminds us that we need to use all of the resources that we have to annotate and build our case for a particular gene that we're working on annotating. And so some of the main players and tools that we will have um, to use are called HHPred, Starterator, BLASTP, and FAMRATOR. And those are just databases that all have different functions that you will later learn about um, to help inform our decisions um, for choosing a start and a function for a particular gene. And there's a really cool um, website that we'll be using called Pecan that actually takes the information from these databases and compiles them onto one sort of mega site so that we can use all of this information um, without having to travel to the different site. It is just a much more simple and efficient way to annotate genes and it makes things so much easier. The 15th and final rule of phage genome annotation is just reminding us that we need to read and reread over our work. We will be teaching you how to double check each other's annotations. Um, peer review is a very good thing and we as scientists um, really, really um, advocate for it because we're humans. We are prone to missing things or um, not making the right connections. And so having another set of eyes going over your work is always a good thing and it is very encouraged in the annotation process.
So we finished all 15 of the rules of annotation for phage genome. And so just to recap all of that, we just went through the simplified versions of the rules, really just to look at the content and just kind of talk through what they mean, get ourselves familiar with the terms um, and the different resources that we will be using to remind ourselves of the different rules and make sure that we are following them to ensure that we are making the right decisions in our calls of genes start locations and their functions.